Hey everybody, how you doing? A little goofiness at the beginning. I wanted to uh, take a few moments to say thanks so much to all of you who are taking time out of your schedule and spending a few moments with me. Also, happy virtual ITG. It's awful shame that I can't see all of you there in person, but we're hoping that next year we'll be able to get together and have so much more fun. Um, let me put this trumpet down. And uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Trent Austin. I run Austin Custom Brass, and uh, it's been an honor and privilege to be at many ITG conferences, and it's a special privilege to present this clinic via the non-pro players group. Thanks so much for the invite. So one of the things that I was doing at the beginning, kind of goofing off, was, uh, you know, giving my instrument a little bit of blame. And, you know, we obviously know that... Um, no mouthpiece or instrument makes or misses a note by itself, but this clinic and the time that we have together is go going to be just some of my thoughts over trying to help find a better match either with an instrument or a mouthpiece, and that's with experiences with literally thousands of players since opening up my shop and also teaching at uh, a few different universities before the shop started. So let's just dig right into it, shall we? We're going to get to the uh, first tip here, and here it comes. Yes, of course. That might be the most obvious thing ever. We've got one size does not fit all. And you might say, well, that's an obvious one, Trent, come on. But I do know of many instances where professors will be like, you play this. Uh, and I think maybe that was an old school philosophy that happened maybe when I was at university, but I know the vast majority of people out there know that everything about each individual person is different. If this was the case and one size did fit everyone, the exhibit halls at ITG would be very, very, very boring. And because there's pretty much everything. I mean, this is a little sample uh, here in my home studio, but they would have one instrument, one mouthpiece, and, and of course it would be fine. That's not the case. We cannot assume that. People are different sizes. People are different heights, weights, different lung capacities, different so many factors in, are involved when we're talking about what size someone should play. Now, you might say to yourself, how do I know what is the correct size? And this is a, this is a bit of an issue. One of the th things that we work on with our customers in the shop, and this is very important, um, we can often do blind tests with them where we hand them mouthpieces where they can't see. We might tape over the mouthpiece or just have them close their eyes. I think it's super, super important uh, that a mouthpiece has to feel good. If we're going to talk about mouthpieces for a second here, the mouthpiece has to feel good. And there are certain things on mouthpieces that might not make it feel good or make it feel really good for you. For instance, Louis Armstrong's mouthpiece. Uh, and this is actually a copy of Roy Eldridge's mouthpieces. I'm going to zoom in here, something, hopefully you can see that. Now, this is acrylic, but so you might not be able to see, but look how flat that rim is. And it's got a quite an aggressive entrance into the cup, you know, bite, alpha angle, whatever you want to call it. That mouthpiece was made for Roy Eldridge. Um, one of the cool things that happened in my life that got me into the mouthpiece making business was Clark Terry handed me a box of mouthpieces and he said, man, I think you're, you're into this stuff. You check them out. And he, I just kept on, you know, showing him mouthpieces. He goes, oh yeah, that was Roy's. Or that was like, for instance, this was Charlie Shaver's old mouthpiece. Pretty cool. It's actually an Alcas and it's in wonderful shape, but this was actually Charlie Shaver's mouthpiece. Definitely different than what you saw here. What you see here, Again, I'm going to try to get it to focus in. What you see here is a super flat rim. What you see here, and is very typical of the, the cast line of mouthpiece, is a very round rim. What works? 
This is player specific. Some people like the flatness of the rim. Some people like the roundness of the rim. If you have questions about this, a very beautifully laid out book for you to check out. Um, Phyllis Stork from Stork Mouthpieces wrote a wonderful text called Understanding the Mouthpiece. I highly recommend that. I'm not gonna dive into a deep uh, ripping apart of mouthpieces because that's not really why this clinic is here. This is more of a broad overview. But back to this point that I'm gonna tell you is it has to feel right. The idea of working into a mouthpiece I truly don't believe. It's got to feel better instantly. And there's a comfort factor to these mouthpieces we're talking about. Now, once the comfort factor is addressed and it, the, it actually feels comfortable, then we have to have the sound characteristic. Is it achieving the sound, desired sound that you want? That's important. Um, then we get to maybe the next set of subtext. How's the articulation? How's the flexibility? And each one of these factors are, are in the design of the mouthpiece. This is a great opportunity for someone who might have questions, like perhaps yourselves out there, to, to get in touch with one of the mouthpiece makers in our industry. And fortunately for you, there, there are many, um, like myself, that can help you guide through that. So that's a brief thing about one size does not fit all. We're going to get back to that a little bit later, but let's move on to the second tip here. And this one's pretty obvious as well. They're all kind of obvious. Bigger's better, right? If that was truly the case and bigger was better than this mouthpiece, this mouthpiece right here would be the greatest mouthpiece ever made. It's the size of my head. Yeah, I don't know. What's the bore size on this anyways? Oh, we'll get to that. But bigger is always better. A couple big things happen as we age. One thing is, and it's very, very um, obvious, is that our lung capacity decreases, unless we're like our heroes, like Doc Severinsen, who keeps up his lung capacity by working out hours and hours a, a day. But our lung capacity decreases. So as we age, one thing that you want to be aware of is trying to find a better match. Now that could be a tighter back bore, for instance, in your mouthpiece. It could be a more open throat. It's not always tighter is better and bigger is better. This is not equal out. This is a resistance profile that you want to feel when you play is something similar. Let me grab my instrument. I like to think about resistance as a directional relationship to, to how I play. And some people like their resistance right up the front where they can have a good responsiveness right in the early part of their mouth pipe or into the instrument itself. Some people want a wide open feel like Arturo, for instance, you know, he came to my shop a few years ago and played my Copernicus, which is the horn designed just for me. Um, and he goes, oh man, it's, it's awesome, but it's so small compared to what I play. Now Arturo likes wide open gear. So you have to understand that the, the factor of bigger is better works for him for sure. Um, for me, I need a little bit more friendly front end resistance. How do I find that? I do certain things on the trumpet like this. I'm going to just change microphones briefly here. trying to do is find the different res resistance profile. Now I'm going to take this and go to a horn that is slightly smaller. It's another beautiful horn in my collection I love and do the same thing. For me personally, 
I That first trumpet I played was an old super recording, one of my favorite horns in my collection. It's a large, large, it's a pretty large bore, it's 0.465 where I measure, um, and it's a pretty open setup. For me, I had a, you even heard it actually, where I missed the high C. That resistance wasn't as friendly. I've been playing a lot more on this gonch horn made by Shoggle, and the rotary trumpet is a smaller bore, and it's also a different lead pipe design. Obviously, the lead pipe is this short, so that changes the resistance profile, which for me, personally, I like. I like it a little bit more responsive from the opening of the instrument. If you have questions about that, this is a great thing to hang out with manufacturers and talk to uh, manufacturers who, that design their instruments, because they can tell you, based on what you want in your resistance profile, how that might work and affect the way the instrument works. So bigger is better, maybe. Um, for instance, on my mouthpiece, let's talk a little bit about mouthpieces. Um, I My mouthpiece, in terms of the throat of the mouthpiece, is actually a few sizes bigger. Now, most people think 27 is the general size of the mouthpiece because Bach mouthpieces, the, the industry you know leader in making the amount of mouthpieces, um, gives their mouthpieces in 27. What we don't know is that Vincent Bach often supplied his customers with a little pin, jeweler's pin reamer, which allowed them to personally open up their throats. Now we're talking about, this was something that he did in the 1920s. Um, so you could open up the throat to change where that resistance is. Personally, I like a larger throat in my mouthpiece. Not a huge throat, but not not a 27 for sure. This is also something that as you hang with a manufacturer and get a little bit more you know, intimate knowledge of how that mouthpiece plays, you can always expand upon that. Bigger is better? Maybe. This leads me to tip number three, and it's a big one. What's the bore size. Look at that hint right there, by the way. <sighs> bore size. So when you're going through the exhibit halls of ITG, you're looking over and you're going, okay, this one, it's got a 0.465 bore. This, this one, Oh wait, that doesn't have any bore. But this one's got a 0.463478812 bore. This one, well that's a trombone, we don't talk about those here. Um, moving along, oh that's a plastic trumpet. We're definitely not gonna talk about what the bore size is on a plastic trumpet. But when, when I work with customers, when they walk into the shop, instantly, the first thing they say, They'll pick up a horn and they'll like it. They'll be like, oh, this trumpet feels really great. Oh yeah. They're, they're playing, they're having good sense of enjoyment and comfort on the instrument. They, and they turn to me and they go, hey Trent, what's the bore size on that? Because bore size itself, it's a number and we're good with numbers, just like a 27 throat. That set, that in our head, that means something. Well, 27 throat really doesn't mean much. It's actually, 27 doesn't actually mean in any sort of physical dimension. It's actually a 0.144 inch measurement. The 27 throat is the size of the reamer. And as you decrease the number, 26, it gets bigger. 25 gets bigger. And it actually doesn't get bigger in an incremental sense, in other words, the difference between 27 throat and a 26 throat is two and a half thousands. Um, and then uh, maybe I'm, I think it's somewhere around there, but then the 26 to 25 is a different number and so on and so forth. Um, I know certain manufacturers actually make throat sizes with an actual uh, drill number, like 0.155 or 0.167, you know, things like that. Makes a lot more sense to be honest, but we still live in that that realm, at least at ACB, of throat sizes indicating actual uh, numerical value in terms of what customers prefer. Okay, bore size. Let's talk about the bore size because the bore size itself 
in this instrument, this beautiful instrument. What's, what, where do we measure the bore size? Well, right there. For the most part, it's inside the second valve slot. You take out your calipers and you can go, oh, well this horn, for instance, this horn has a 0.4645 bore size. So that's gonna tell you something, right? Well, I want you to, to think about a small bore trumpet, like the classic Con Constellation. And that's the horn, if you're not familiar with the Con Constellation, that's the horn that some of the greatest you know, jazz players played. Uh, Maynard Ferguson made it very popular. Guys like uh, the whole uh, Ellington trumpet section, Cat Anderson, Clark Terry, Cootie Williams, uh, Thad Jones, then into some modern players that play constellations. Uh, we can think of the great Brian McDonald, lead trumpet player uh, in the Airmen of Note. He plays a 36B. Tom Harrell plays a 36B. Uh, that horn is like one of the most sought off after horns for mariachi players because they all think, oh, it feels so open. It feels so open, the Con Constellation. And there are so many design factors past bore size. This is where we're going. There's so many factors past the bore size where I get it. I get it. So this bore size in a Con Constellation is 0.438. If you take out your you know, Bach Stradivarius or your Adams A2 trumpet, they are 0.459 or 0.460, which is generally the most common bore size. So if you walk up to a trumpet, before you even play a note, and you're saying, and you're saying to yourself, let's say, let's grab this and go, hey, Mr. Trumpet, how you doing? What's your bore size? When we talk about rotary trumpets, and there's a reason why I chose these two trumpets, particularly in today's discussion, because they're so vastly different. Yet, I play both of them often because they give me very, very consistent results. Even though they're totally different instruments, this bore size is much smaller. The rotary trumpet bore size is, is actually closer to that constellation number I gave you than that large bore old super recording. What's, you know, which one's better? Woo, that, this is where you as a player get to have the discussion. The player goes, okay, if I want my horn to be wide open with a large bore, that might help me in terms of the, the feel of playing. A lot of people want that open playing, and I think that's good. I think resistance is a very beautiful thing, personally, because inside an exhibit hall, in a crowded exhibit hall at a loud conference, it's very challenging to, to find a good match. You're only going to find a good match on that third set of your four-hour, you know, salsa band gig, or you're going to find it at the end of the second half on your community band concert. You're going to find it, you know, when you're playing that last, you know, chorus of the hymn. And that's when you, you're going to be like, boy, I wish this wasn't as, as open. <laughs> or, oh, I'm really getting tight. I wish it was more open. Um, things to help you when you test out a trumpet for finding resistance. This is, these are important. Let me grab my mouthpiece. I think bending really, really helps. So I'm trying to bend into the, the notes below and above a little bit, but mostly below. Most players can do this. It's almost like a really loose gliss. What I'm doing there is just seeing how much energy is needed to go down to the G from the C. And I'm going to do the same thing going up. And we can't have the same glissando effect, but I'm trying to just feel, touch the note and feel where that resistance is. I personally know what I want. You as a player, you want to start experiencing this as well. Another thing that's going to really help you when you're dealing with finding maybe what the best bore size is for you is to do certain types of louder playing, sustained loud playing, uh, something that I think of, and I'll be sure to uh, give uh, ITG the link, is the link to the Shilky Power Exercises. They're simple 
half node exercises that you could do, which I'm not going to do that too much louder because my dogs upstairs will freak out at that, but where you're actually going at max capacity, this will help feel where your air you and it's almost like a visualization where your air goes through the instrument and what you want. Another thing I have all of our customers do when they come into the shop is do single tongued articulated notes to try to find where that friendly point is on the resistance. Let me show you here. What I'm trying on there is to make sure I feel where my air wants to go in the instrument. Um, I gotta say this, and this is an important point that I didn't put in a tip, which I should have. Um, this point of switching both your instrument and mouthpiece, please do not do that. Because we have two, var two variables, or in this case, in my playing, because I'm allergic to silver and gold, and when I play a silver mouthpiece, which I did a little bit before this uh, recording, I get a little red mark right there. Um, this has got a uh, top, backboard, and an instrument, so there can be more. If I switched out my backboard, for instance, and then tried to switch out a trumpet, that might be a little challenging because I'm not necessarily understanding where the resistance is changing. And this is a hard thing to do. Say you're at a conference and you're walking around, you're like, man, look at all this awesome stuff. I'm going to get one of that, one of that, one of that, one of that, one of this. As a vendor, we say thank you so much. But as a, as a teacher myself, I'm like, hold on, let's figure out what is the best starting point. For me personally, the best starting point is finding the best mouthpiece that fits my dental structure that fits where I want the resistance to come from. And then I can plug and play that into many instruments and get a similar result. Granted that the instrument is of fine quality. If I put it in, um, for instance, the plastic trumpet, I'm not going to necessarily get the same result that I would get from playing a, a gaunch horn. Uh, that's yeah, that's, I wish that was the case, but unfortunately it's not. So back to the tip here. What's the bore size? That was a long discussion about bore size, but I gotta tell you, it's whatever the best bore size for you. Okay, let's talk some physical things and how they relate to mouthpieces and instruments. And this one's an, uh, one that I've done a little bit of research here and I'm just gonna talk, not a long amount, but I'm gonna talk to you about And yeah, I gotta love that, the, the, the glockenspiel noise, I'm sorry. It makes me feel like I'm in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So lips and aging. Just how I referred a few minutes ago, I referred to the, our lung capacity. And as we age, our lung capacity gets, gets less and less, unless you're doing some physical activity. For me, I've really dedicated myself to being uh, downstairs here in my Zwift sphere on my, on my bicycle. Uh, and it's helped me a tremendous amount in the past even four or five months in terms of making the instrument a lot easier for me. But our lips change. So you're 18 years old, you get your one and a half C and you're, you you know, then you quit playing, you go into a career of whatever. And now you're, say you're 45 years old and you're like, hey, uh, I want to play again. Well, your lips are not the same shape. Your facial muscles are not the same condition as when you were 18. Your dental structure and the amount of actual teeth that you have left, um, those all shrink with age. So be careful to think about like that and how it relates to this. Because for instance, I'll tell you something that's happened with me. I, uh, I've lost a little bit of weight. I'm still working on it, of course. But I was playing a large mouthpiece for many, many years, maybe four or five years. And with the loss of weight, I lost some, some size in my face. Um, and I've actually had to go down 
from a 0.664 to a 0.650. That feels much more comfortable for me now. I'm not saying that as you age, you're gonna go to a smaller mouthpiece, but here's the important point for you. If you're playing your mouthpiece, and you've been playing your mouthpiece for 30 years, say, and you're struggling on endurance, even though you're practicing the exact same amount that you've been practicing, you're going to your rehearsals and doing the time on the instrument, but you're you're feeling like, ah, I'm just, I couldn't, it feels so big to me. That could be a sign of this. As we age, as we age, our lip size actually decrease. Um, now, unfortunately, when I was doing research on this, I had to go through a lot of, you know, people, you know, who wanted to give me Botox, but we're not gonna, you know, ask you out there to, to go grab some Botox. What I'm talking about here, um, there are some just some common tips that you can do when you're, you know, aging and you think that maybe possibly you've uh, lost some facial tissue. So check out, these are some tips from a beauty site. So the hyperlinks aren't gonna work, but I thought they'd be important for us to talk about right now, you know? Less sugar, well, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, you know, less sugar in general. Um, moisturizing your skin. Sounds silly, but these are very important things. Protect your skin, sin from, skin from the sun, wind, and cold. And this one is huge because these are so fragile. I'm gonna add a few more. Drink water, hydrate yourself. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna drink some water right now. To keep myself hydrated as well. You, most of this tissue is water. So, you know, especially in performances, bring the water with you because you're gonna dry out, no doubt. So that's an important thing to understand that not only do our does our lung capacity decrease unless we, you know, make sure that we're doing as much aerobic activity. And if you watch the recent documentary, I love that documentary of our hero, Doc Severinsen, there's that great scene of him in the gym. And I know personally remember when uh, he was working at the beginning of his time with Shires, I was still living in Boston and um, I was a Shires artist before I opened my shop. And we would hang out at the shop, Doc and I playing trumpets and hanging out. It was so much, so much fun. And Doc would be doing planks. And I'd be like, man, what's that? He goes, oh, I'll show you. So I got down I, and I was like, I could barely do 30 seconds. And he goes, oh man, I would do four minute plank before I came here from, you know, this morning. And I'm like, wow. And the guy was like 87 years old. So an inspiration to us all to keep active, but understand that some of these things physically with our teeth, for instance, I, I highly encourage you to get a mold made of your teeth. Now, that used to be a lot more challenging back in the day. But now, you can. I think you can even go on Amazon and get a mold kit to help for that. This way, if say something happens, say you get into a, you're, you're cycling and you get into a cycling accident, you have to have some replacement teeth put in. This will help you get closer to normal. Every, every year our teeth are moving. It's just the functionality. Um, so be understanding that that's gonna change not only where the lips go, the position of the lips, but it's also gonna change the size of mouthpieces and what you might need. Say you're, you know, your teeth, teeth are receding at a certain point where you're like, okay, I need to get a smaller mouthpiece. Consult, you know, a tech, uh, someone, that does this, that has worked with, you know, students of all ages. That's important stuff there. So, which gets me to this, which isn't necessarily a tip about what kind of instrument to choose and what kind of mouthpiece to choose, but here's something we see it all the time in our shop. It's, it's an actual shocking uh, number, actually. So, let me uh, get to tip five here.
keep it clean. Now, that might seem like a very, very obvious answer. And maybe this doesn't apply to, to us here at the no, the non-pro player uh, group, but I will tell you when we have customers come into the shop and they're like, I need a new trumpet because my trumpet's not working right. Almost always, I would say maybe 95%, the trumpet needs a good professional servicing. There are certain things that I'm gonna show you now. Um, there's one thing in particular that will help you. But, you know, if your valves are looking like this, or like a rotary trumpet here, if your rotors are, how many cheeseburgers and Pizza, that's, that is like a scene from Alien, by the way, right? I mean, you're like, I don't even know what's in that. Or you get this, and this is something I'm going to talk about as well. You ever see spots on your lead pipe or on your tuning slide? Those are, are indicators of red rot. Now, red rot is uh, basically desinctification. It's rust from the inside of your instrument to, to the outside. Yeah, I, I'm almost certain that any out, any tiny bit of red rot decreases a horn's resonance. We've done studies where we've taken vintage trumpets and replaced them with, you know, exact replicas, new old stock parts even, of old Selmer lead pipes on Selmer balance trumpets, for instance. And it's shocking how much better the new lead pipe plays. Now you could say, well, that makes a lot of sense because if you're not, if your lead pipe is full of debris, basically, how, how well is that going to play? And just personally, I'm really lazy about this because I have a shop and I have ultrasonic machines that I can like go and clean my horn. For you, the important thing to think about here is making sure you have some sort of daily maintenance that you don't even have to think about. So there's only one product plug in this entire video because honestly, this is a, an incredible game changer. The blow dry brass, which is 20 bucks at our shop, I think, is the easiest thing to do once you have a clean horn. Now your horn has to be clean, folks, but once you have, your, have a clean horn, all you do is take the bit you put it through the lead pipe and you shoot it out. It's not a spitball. Spitballs are designed to clear out debris, which if your horn is dirty, that's cool. But my problem with spitballs, other than trying to hit the flute players always in band um, when I was a kid, is that they got stuck in the horn. And if it gets stuck in the horn, it's really hard to perform, obviously. These do not get stuck because of the, there's a very beautiful foam that Lisa, who uh, you does the blow dry brass uses. Um, so I cannot recommend this product. It's literally, I have one in every case and as soon as I get done playing, I play a, I play a rehearsal, I blow it through. It also keeps your horn clean and, and safe, which in this time, more than at any, especially if you're gonna be passing horns from friends to friends, use one of these always before you do it. So. That's my spiel on keeping it clean. You gotta keep the instrument clean because it, it will perform better. There's no doubt about that. So let's um go to the final tip that we have. And then I'm gonna just hit some of the topics that will help you as you're going into a shop, try to figure out some of the things that might give you an advantage on is this the right thing for me? So tip six and the final tip. Sometimes it's not necessarily, oh wait. Forgot to ring the bell. How could I forget to ring the bell? And in case you forgot what that tip was, I'm bringing it back. Sometimes as we age, there's a lot of things that tend to go. In my case, the hair's gone. Um, there's definitely stuff up here that's gone, but we're not gonna, you would need a lot longer to talk about that. But my hearing is going and it's bad. Um, years of touring and playing next to bass cabinets and ride cymbals have, uh, I have tinnitus in my left ear, which is, is a total drag. So one thing I always practice with is this little guy. 
which maybe you can see it. I'll have to get a, a camera to zoom in here. So hold on. Right there, this guy. It's an earplug. What? Huh? What? It's an earplug, but this is a musician's earplug. I, I actually had an audiologist make custom earplugs for me, but I, I hate how it feels when I have both of them in. It almost feels like I'm underwater. And you do hear, when you have earplugs in, you do hear your sound inside your brain cavity, which is kind of cool and eerie at the same time. But this little guy I put in, and I just, most of the time I just put it in my left ear. This reduces, you know, in this one you have to like kind of wiggle in a little bit. There we go. That reduces the sound by a good percentage, 15, 20 decibels, which really helps a tremendous amount. Um, Play with earplugs and folks, practice with your earplugs because you can't expect for those earplugs to work if you just pick them up and put them in. You gotta practice with them. Now, you don't have to practice them with all day, but put them in and when you get to rehearsal, put them in because your ears are precious. And a lot of my older students I work with have massive hearing problems. So be kind to your ears. Um, one thing, that we see in the shop, and especially I notice myself as I'm aging, um, that I tend to do, because my hearing's getting worse and worse, is that I tend to over push and overpower the instrument. So there's one, okay, there's another little gadget that I like. I don't tend to like many gadgets, but this is kind of cool. This is, and you can get like a sound shield for a microphone, or in this case, this is called the selfie sound. Um, all you do is you just clip it to your bell, and I know that was riveting, but you clip it to your bell and I've got one more clip there. There we go. And what this does, this is like an instant feedback where if I turn this down. tell you that makes practicing so so much more fun even though it does give me an honest representation of what my sound is but when I'm playing especially in a louder acoustic like an orchestra like something like a rock band concert or outdoors have we've all had to play outdoors this past year that's for sure um that sound shield oh it's worth its weight in gold because it allows me to understand that there's peak capacity limits that I always go over when I can't hear myself. When you can't hear yourself, oh, it's such a drag. We all have played with bad sound engineers, either you know someone who says they're a sound engineer, but they then the moment they see the trumpet, they take their volume knob on the trumpet and go, whoo. So then, then we have to compensate. This allows me to play at a very comfortable dynamic and get the best result. So let's recap all of these tips one by one. Tip one, one size does not fit all. What your teacher might play might not be the best thing for you and vice versa. How do you find that size? How do you find that size is going to find the best feel, especially when it comes to mouthpiece, the best feel, comfort, responsiveness, and feel where that resistance is. Where do you want the resistance in the instrument? Tip number two, bigger is better, right? Well, we already talked about that. I'm a fan of a moderate bore size, moderate bell size, that works for me. Tip number three, this is the big one. What's the bar size? You know I'm gonna give you a ding on that one. Of course. What's the bore size? The bore size. It everything affects everything. The famous acoustician Bill Cardwell said that. You change one factor in trumpet design, it then affects a bunch of things. I remember when we were working on the A1 trumpet at Adams, we changed the weight of a valve cap by grams and it would drastically change the responsiveness. Um, we also did on one of the trumpets, the high E flat was flat. So what we did is we added a counterweight 
in between the second slide tubes. A counterweight right there popped the E-flat in tune. Um, you might see it, for instance, we'll go on Doc's horn. You see like a little weighted receiver on Doc Severinsen's trumpet. That is um, a tonal enhancer. It's not gimmick. It, it was an accident originally. It was a trigger screw that someone left on, but it, then Doc really liked that. So back to the bore size. That's a player specific thing. Lips and aging, and why it matters. Make sure you stay hydrated. Make sure that as you age, if you feel like your mouthpiece is too big, it might just be too big. Big mouthpiece, big sound? Well, if that was the case, Cat Anderson, who had the tiniest mouthpiece out there, would have a tiny sound. But Cat's sound was gigantic. Now, it was quite bright, and that's that's a direct result of his Charlie Allen mouthpiece, which we all do love. I can't wait for ITG 2022, because we'll have the Cat Anderson mouthpiece at our booth here at ACB, and you'll be able to try to play it. <laughs> it's hilariously small, but work for cat. So that's lips and aging. Tip five, keep your horn clean. Keep your mouthpiece clean. Make sure you're doing that because it's so vitally, vitally important to keep your instrument clean. As always, if you have questions about the, the things that I've talked about, you're more then welcome to reach out to me. And in that case, hold on, I'm gonna give you there you go. Wherever that might be, that's that's our email address, folks. Whoa, I could put it right here, it's better. That's our email. No. You can reach out to us at info.austincustombrass.com and we'd be more than happy to schedule a uh, a Zoom call or a private phone consultation to talk to you about that. Uh, that's a good thing. Part of the, the issue I have personally is that I've played, oh my gosh, I've played and owned thousands of trumpets. Um, and uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. The, the, the final thing is I always sound like me, maybe a bad thing or a good thing, depending on what you might think. Um, but it's finding that one that works the best. So feel free again to reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Um, of course, um, I wanted to take a moment to, to share with you um, our sponsors today. You know, it was coming. <clears throat> our sponsors today are, let me get rid of this, hold on is the non-pro -pro player committee. And these people work tirelessly at ITG to make sure that the people, they can benefit the best. We're all in this together, regardless if you're the principal trumpet player, the lead trumpet player, or you're someone who plays once a week in your community band. This is a great place. And one thing I wanted to share with you in addition to that, and th thank you so much, Don Halleck, for having me here and uh, you know letting me present for a few moments. Um, and again, to you who watched this and survived this uh, workshop, I truly appreciate you. And I wish I was there with you at ITG. It's m one of the funnest weeks we have, um, but we can't wait for the next one for sure. Um, final thoughts here. Be sure to check out the NPP sites and both of those sites. I'm going to leave this up for just a little bit so you can write them down uh, right now or take a screenshot of this presentation. The, the first one is the actual link on the ITG page. Um, the second one is a quarterly email. So they won't bombard you with emails. It's not, um, you do, it's not Wayfair where we're going to get an email every 20 seconds. I'll probably just get 30 emails now that I said Wayfair, you know, um, but <laughs> Sorry, Wayfair. But uh, the thing about it is sign up with them. They are amazing people who are doing great work and you will have a ton of fun. Again, thanks so much. I wish you all the best. I'm going to give you a little serenade. As uh, Jackie Gleason would say, uh, let's hear some traveling music. And that would actually be this, I think.
Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the virtual conference, my friends. And I cannot wait to see you again. Big hugs and love from all of us at ACV to you. Take care.